Hey there, I am having a real struggle recording. You know, I was thinking, I have not done very many videos lately, and part of the reason, among a numerous things, is that I've got this new phone, and it's a little smaller because I was tired of the big phone, it was clumsy in my hand, but my hand is always covering up the microphone, and at least 60% of my videos have been a waste of time. <laughs> so... This time, I just recorded for several minutes, and it was anointed. I felt an unction. And then I realized I wasn't recording. So, let's try this again. There is a continuation happening of the message series... No, not message series. The idea of chipping away at this meritorious idea... At meritorious works idea of putting God in debt by our works... And then being rewarded for it. Um, there is reward. And there is a something called the Bema Seat. So first let me talk about the Bema Seat. The Bema Seat appears... The first time we see it in the scripture is really interesting. Because it sets the tone. Um, the first time we see it is with Pontius Pilate. And it's where he decides between... Jesus and Barabbas, and what he did was he found Jesus to be innocent and said he was a just man, and then offered him or Barabbas to the people, and and even said, "Behold your king." When they talked about when he talked about Jesus, and I recommend Patrick L's message. He gave it a couple of weeks ago about Barabbas and Jesus. It's really fascinating. Their names mean the same thing. So in a way, when they rejected Jesus and received Barabbas in his place. They were uh, taking another Jesus. It's kind of interesting. But anyway, Barabbas really represents all of us. And he went free while Jesus died in his place, really. And Jesus died in all of our place. And it was really the pivotal moment where this decision was made that Jesus would go to death for us, as far as men are concerned, is in that moment at the Bema seat where Pontius Pilate sat there and declared him to be just, and yet he died for us anyway. Um, now, that is, according to the law of first mention, that first mention in the Bible of something like that that's significant really governs its context. And that's the first time we see the Bema seat. And I believe it's significant. We were justified when Jesus rose from the dead. He rose for our justification. But it was determined that he would be our substitute, yes, from the foundation of the world. But that pivotal moment at the Bema seat with Pontius Pilate was where it all came to a head in human history and it was decided he was going to the cross. In the place, the just in the place of the unjust, literally. Uh, for Barabbas, for us, from God's point of view, and even from man's point of view. Um, okay, the next time we see the Bema seat, that same person who was delivered over for us to be a substitute, to grant us the free gift of righteousness through his blood, he, the next time we see it, the Bema seat, he'll be there, okay? And in that time, it will not be a matter of our merit or our works. It will be a matter of praise and reward because that aspect of the Bema is borrowed from the Olympic Games and it has to do with when the prizes were given out at the end of the games. So, the next time we see him, his reward will be with him. And this is all one thing. The Bema Seat has to do with justification and reward. And we are justified. Not only in our life, but definitely at the Bema Seat. And that is really critical to understand. Because... So many people who are justified by faith have fear about that day when they see the Lord. And it's because they don't really see that justification covers them there and that it's strictly a matter of reward. Um, they think he's going to have a rebuke for them. 
But Hebrews says that he'll come again without sin or without reference to sin unto salvation to those who look for him. That's us. If we are believers in the church, we are looking for his appearing. And when we see him, here's what's going to happen. We are going to have already passed through fire. We're baptized in the spirit into one body, and then we'll be baptized in fire as we pass through whatever it is that transfigures our mortal bodies and makes them like his. And the Bible says that when we see him, we shall be as he is. That means that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. There will be no spot in us, no blemish, nothing of sin and nothing to rebuke. There's no point in rebuking it because the only reason God rebukes anything is to correct us. He never rebukes us out of anger. He rebukes us uh, that we may be partakers of his holiness, and he does that while we're in this age. It's only in this age that we need to worry about these things. When we sow to the flesh in this age, we will of the flesh reap corruption in this age. But when the flesh is put off, there's no more corruption to reap. And when we stand before the Lord, the flesh with its works will be burned up. It'll And that burning will already be past tense. It'll have already happened. And we'll be standing there with whatever remains that passed through the fire. And that will be our reward. And I guarantee you, Jesus is not going to rebuke you. He is going to be receiving you as a trophy of his workmanship uh, and what he accomplished unto praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's something to think about. Now, um, 1 Corinthians 3 talks about the nature of rewards because it's not what we think. First of all, so we should seen we are justified. Okay, we're justified at that beam of seat so that there's no reference to sin and there's no... There's nothing that we need to worry about in that respect. Um, but what we do want is to have reward, right? But, so there is reward. However, I just, I want to emphasize that it's not what you're th typically thinking. Because there's no way to put God in debt for your works. Um, that's what we see in the whole matter of justification is that it's either Christ or you, you are, he substituted you. He is not only your righteousness, he's your life and he's your reward. And in that day, whatever he has been able to work in to you and through you that remains, that's incorruptible will be found to praise in that day. Okay. So, we know we, there is reward, right? Verse 5 of uh, 1 Corinthians 3. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I've planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. So it's God working. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall have his own reward according to his own labor. There it is. We do have a reward according to our labor. Now remember, in another place, he says, I labored more than they all, but not I, but God's grace worketh in me. So that's important that you understand that however much you're able to labor is totally based on the creative work of God's grace in making you a member of the body and equipping you and giving you a sphere of operation which may be very limited or may be very grand based not on his recognition of what you are and how great you are but based on the need for the body okay and the more you uh give apparently the more you're going to suffer because paul suffered a lot so god also knows how much you can take paul could take it for some reason, he had the right kind of personality to be the vessel that God raised up for the body of Christ and to be able to endure all the things he endured and keep going. I am a quitter by nature, 
And so there's a very limited, I finally accept that there's a very limited set of scenarios in which I can function. And now that I've accepted that, God's able to use me in these limitations with my weaknesses to do whatever it is I'm supposed to do. And I'm doing what I do based on what I enjoy, not not anything else, you know. It's really based on my enjoyment of Christ and what I can um, share of that, okay? Um, but there's a reward for labor, right? But what kind of labor? Um he says, according to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master building. Oh, here, I skipped a verse. I'm sorry. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry and you are God's building. Now, he's going to talk about building here. And labor is related to building. And building is a theme in the Bible, the main theme. There's two big themes. There's life. We need to receive the eternal life. And there's building. God wants to build a habitation for himself in the spirit, and that is the church. And ministry is for the building up of the church. And most people, unfortunately, don't see the matter of building. They only see their own selves and their own works. But building up has to do with sharing in the fellowship with other believers and edifying one another and as we do, and as we come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ, he makes his home in our heart, and we become built up to be his dwelling place where he's satisfied, resting in us. That's what God wants for eternity. And, and that's finally expressed in the new city, Jerusalem, which is made of incorruptible materials. Inwardly, it's made of gold, which speaks of the faith and the divine nature. Outwardly, it's made up of the living stones that have been built together, to become the outward appearance of the city as they've been built together and transformed and knit together in love. That is the church. That is God's people um, who eventually express God, who shines from within them as the gold. But it's all material that can pass through fire. None of it is corruptible. And that's the point of the kind of material. And that's what he's going to get to talking about here. The, you're God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid a foundation and another builds on it. Let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For no other foundation can one lay that has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work will be manifested for the day will declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is if any man's work abides which he have built upon he will receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet as through fire okay so number one at the judgment seat for believers there's no talk of loss of salvation number two it's possible that your works could be burned off if they're made of corrupt material, which is wood, hay, and stubble. But you will be saved, but it, you'll suffer loss, right? Um, now, that is something very severe. In context, what Paul is talking about is people who damage the building of God through selfish ambition and divisive uh, practices that damage fellowship and bring people into confusion and condemnation, especially those who build up a system of error. He's talking about ministers who are working in the flesh. Even though they're saved, beyond that they're not clear, they're carnal, and they keep working under a works concept, and they bring everybody into bondage and confusion. They are going to suffer loss. Unfortunately, in Christianity, that seems to be the norm. But this is supposed to be pretty rare. Because he says, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone is among you who seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And he goes on, but... The point he's making in all of this, the context, is that everybody was saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos. Now, they weren't really doing it with them. They were really doing it with the false apostles. 
And what he was saying is, look, you're being carnal. You're in the flesh. You're naturally minded. And as a result, these people who've brought you into this condition have damaged God's building. They may be saved, but they are building with wood, hay, and stubble. See? So, and ultimately, if they're not believers, they'll be destroyed. But if you follow after them as a pattern, even though you're saved, you may be building with wood, hay, and stubble. By being divisive and continuing and perpetuating these systems of error and confusion. But in co So that's wood, hay, and stubble, and it's all flesh. Now, in contrast, there's those that build with gold, silver, and precious stones. These are the incorruptible materials that really correspond with the new city Jerusalem and can pass through fire. Now, the fire happens not because Jesus burns something, but because the day Rude declares it, right? Every man's work shall be manifested because the day will declare it, because it'll be revealed by fire. Fire shall try every man's work, sort of what it is. In other words, when that day dawns and Jesus is revealed, that's going to be a day of fire for us. It's going to burn off everything that was not corruptible. We all will have things burnt off. Don't think that anybody's going to have everything in their life perfectly preserved. No, but what you do have preserved will be eternally rewarded. Now, an eternal reward, we have no concept of how to get our mind around that. An eternal reward is something that you will enjoy forever in an inexhaustible measure without any degradation of that enjoyment. You can't even imagine what that means. One it, thimbleful of whatever that enjoyment is, whatever that reward is, will last you for eternity. It's incorruptible. We don't understand. I don't understand. But I know that the reward far outweighs anything that uh, we, if we think we're laboring, you know. Um, and it reminds me of what he says in Second Corinthians, where he says, the momentary light affliction of the present is not worthy to be compared to the eternal weight of glory which is being wrought in us. And that glory will be revealed in that day. There is a glory that's going to be revealed. And it's going to be it's going to be related to this gold, silver, and precious stones. Okay? Now what is he talking about? First of all, again, he's talking about building up the body of Christ. Everything is in the context of building. And those who talk about um reward so much almost never talk about building they talk about their individual works well you can go do this and you can go do that and you can go do this and yet none of it has to do with building up the body of christ how is the body built up well it's through the f operation of every member as they speak the truth to one another in love and encourage each other in the lord and bring out nourishing truths in the gospel that's really what it is it's as we turn to one another and speak of the Lord and encourage each other in the Lord. So, um, these incorruptible materials, though, I'm going to take a quick look at 1 Peter. Uh, and I highlighted the there's four things that Peter says are incorruptible, which I think are directly related because the scripture is designed to go together, right? First of all, We've been begotten unto a living hope by the resurrection from the dead, of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now this word inheritance is also our reward. It's on the one hand an inheritance, on the other hand it's a reward. And it's predestined for everybody. What it, it, It's something we all have in common, because he says in Colossians, um, you are all qualified to partake of the share, the allotted portion of the saints in light. And so it's, it's something we all have in common and is singular. And I believe it's Christ himself. And yet there's an individual enjoyment of it that's tailored to each of us, uh, based on God's allotment, you know, and yet it's also worked out through our labor somehow. Um, See, when we labor for the building up of the body of Christ, in 2 Corinthians 3, it talks about the New Testament ministry, and he says that you are an epistle known 
and read of all men, your epistle of Christ, written on our hearts. It's interesting because you are the epistle, but you're also written on our hearts, meaning that whatever was worked into you through this ministry was also worked into us. And he compares that, or well, he, he says that that is the eternal weight of glory that's being wrought into us. The ministry of righteousness has a glory that far exceeds that of the law. It's the ministry of the Spirit that gives life. And not only does the person who's the beneficiary partake of that, but the one who's dispensing the life partakes of it. When I minister, when I build, something is worked into me too. It's a fellowship. It's a flow of the Spirit. Okay, we're both benefiting from it. We're both being built up in it. Both of us are having Christ wrought into us as he shines the light on him and as we enjoy him in the word together and enjoy and build one another up. Or let's say I'm building you up and you are enjoying it. I'm enjoying it too. It's being worked in me and in you. So building is the working of the measure of Christ in me for you, and yet it's also for me. And that'll all be revealed in that day when the day has burnt off everything and we stand before the Lord with whatever remains. We'll be standing there with what remains. He's not going to give it to us. It'll be a part of who we are. He's just going to be smiling at us, rejoicing to see us. That's what I believe. Um, so anyway, there's the incorruptible inheritance and the gospel tells us about the inheritance. If you, uh, in Colossians, it says, um, you know, be, we pray for you, uh, you're doing so well, basically. He says, because of the hope laid up for you in the heavens of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, even as it is also in all the world bearing fruit and growing. The word of the gospel comes and tells you about an inheritance that God has for you. So, and that inheritance is incorruptible and undefiled. So is the word of the gospel. And that's one of the other things he says that's incorruptible is we have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So there's the incorruptible inheritance and then there's the incorruptible word of the gospel through through which we are begotten of God unto that inheritance. And the other thing that's incorruptible is that you were redeemed not with corruptible things, as with silver and gold, but from your uh, vain conversation received from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. Now, the re precious blood actually... Um, corresponds with the silver remember there's gold silver and precious stones the incorruptible materials of the building with which we're to work okay um so we have the silver in the bible is always related to redemptive blood uh it was the shekel of the sanctuary for every man that was born there was a shekel of silver given uh for his soul which is a picture of redemption. It's related directly to redemption. And then, like, you know, Judas betrayed Jesus, innocent blood for silver. Silver and innocent blood go together a lot. Um, if you, you just have to do a search on it. The Brethren wrote about that a lot. But silver is related to the blood, okay? And uh, the redemption, the redemptive precious blood of Christ is incorruptible. The inheritance is incorruptible. And the word is incorruptible. And there's one other thing. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold, which perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now that is what is going to be our rejoicing entrance with all the applause. Is our faith will be found to praise and honor and glory when he's revealed. And it's directly related to fire there, right? It's the thing that's really tried with the fire is this faith. There's the reward of faith. Remember, it says in Hebrews, don't cast off your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Just being confident that the Lord has done everything. But anyway, the faith is related to gold. And the divine life is related to gold too.
Um, through faith... We receive the life by which we're begotten unto the inheritance that the gospel told us about and which Jesus' blood purchased for us and redeemed us for. So we've been redeemed by the incorruptible blood, right? And we have been made uh, redeemed for an inheritance which is incorruptible. And then the incorruptible word of the truth of the gospel came to us and told us about that inheritance and told us about Christ's redemption. And we believed it. And that faith that we have is incorruptible. It can be tried by fire, but it'll be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I've given a message that said, uh, you know, you can't lose your faith because it's not your own. On the one hand, somehow we believe the gospel and we're accountable for it. But remember in John 3, it says that many believed him because of the miracles he did, but he didn't entrust himself to anyone because he knew what was in man. Men's faith is fickle. Our ability to believe, if it's based on us, you could argue, argue me out of it tomorrow with a better and more convincing argument. But the faith... Uh, First Peter talks about, I think the very beginning of it says that we have obtained like precious faith. Uh, maybe it's Second Peter, sorry. We have obtained the faith. The faith has been delivered once and for all. It is the faith. It is the faith of the Son of God, actually. Because that's what it says uh, in Galatians is, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Hebrews 2 talks about how he said, I will put my trust in you in the midst of the congregation. That faith is incorruptible because it's Christ himself is our life. So the four incorruptible things, again, are the faith, the blood, the gospel, and the inheritance. And they all go together. And this is the precious materials, gold, silver, and precious stones. Gold corresponds with the faith and the life. Precious stones, really the inheritance. And uh, silver is the blood, the redemption. And all of these go together in the gospel. So when we minister in the gospel and believe in the gospel and edify others with the gospel, we are working with incorruptible materials to build. How do you know you're being built? Because there's fellowship. Ministry should produce fellowship. Remember the Apostle John said, I write these things to you that you may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So many people minister so-called and their goal is not fellowship. They're not wanting to bring anything into anybody or bring anybody into their sphere or enjoy anything mutually with anybody. Their motivation is to lord it over people. That's why they like the law, because it gives them a feeling of power by putting people into fear. And when people are in fear, they start apologizing and groveling before you and exalting you and flattering you. <laughs> And you become lifted up because you're supposedly the pattern and the guide to the blind. That's not ministry. And that's what most pastors, most pastors do that. They have no desire for fellowship. They're not doing anything out of a mutual thirst. Remember, the work of building up has to be something that is in both of us. The ministry of the New Testament is something that is wrought in me and in you. It's together that we enjoy and are satisfied with Christ as we consider him in the gospel. And that's what it means to build with the incorruptible materials. It's in the fellowship. So if you're the kind of person who has lots of knowledge, let's say Bible knowledge, and you're able to tell people about your Bible knowledge all the time, but that never brings you into fellowship, and you think, oh, I'm really serving God because I'm talking about the Bible all the time. I think that you, there's a good chance that much of that is wood, hay, and stubble. Now, all of us have a mix. Don't. That's why we can't judge ourselves. We don't even know. We really don't know. All we can measure, and I wouldn't even call it measure, 
is we can know, am I in fellowship? How do I know if I'm in fellowship? Well, I got a thankful heart. I'm conscious that Christ is for me and I'm conscious of other people. Like YouTube has really helped me um, because I've been isolated for so long and I am seeing Christ work in people and it's causing my heart to rejoice. When you're not in the fellowship, when you see God working in other people, you get jealous and you go, what's wrong with me? And why is he using them? <laughs> that's not ministry. That's not building. That's not faith. That is wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, but when you're in the fellowship, you see Christ in people and you're just so appreciative. So it's something to think about, you know. Um, you know, do I believe there's rewards for this kind of labor. Yeah. But is it a labor? No, I feel like it's an enjoyment when I'm really hitting the mark. It just feels like an enjoyment. It feels like I have to do it. And I'm so thankful to be able to do it. And I'm thankful to share these truths with people who get it. And we're brought into a fellowship, you know, and anybody can do that. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be profound. You don't have to be deep or anything. You just have to really have been brought to a place where you know that only Jesus Christ is your righteousness. Once you understand justification, you've got one good big chunk of it, you know, and then you just enjoy him with others. Don't worry about whether you're going to be rewarded. Anything that's wrought in you and anything that you've enjoyed of another's ministry is also part of the building. See, it's not just building, it's also being built. If you have enjoyed somebody else's spirit and their ministry, that's wrought into you, and that's something that's going to remain. It's just something to think about. And anything that's remained is going to be praised. And it's not that we're going to be praised, it's that Christ is going to be praised <laughs> because of what he's wrought and what he's built. All we did was get out of the way. And the more we get out of the way, the more he has freedom to do what he wants to do in us. Okay, I got to get going. I'll talk to you later.